As we look at the rise of civilizations around the globe, it is clear that this development shared certain characteristics and qualities no matter where it arose. In each case, for example, we see the domestication of plants and in most cases animals. This revolutionary technology allows once nomadic people to settle down and plan, first in small groups of clans and tribes, and then in larger gatherings. This gives rise to towns, and in some cases, cities, and then some form of record keeping. That often leads to writing of some kind, and mathematics, and then as they say, you're off to the races. All of this, however, rests on a more fundamental skill the ability to predict the seasons of planting and harvest. Civilizations that did this well gained a tremendous advantage over those who could not predict, plan, and adjust their ways to a new reality that allowed for specialization of roles and tasks to maximize efficient food production and storage. When it comes to agriculture, this prediction and planning required both the ability to keep track of time and ways to transmit information from one generation to the next and from one group to another. While the time to be tracked involved the seasonal variations in weather appropriate for a given climate, it was the sky that was the more reliable clock, and so early astronomy was a powerful tool to be used to track the passage of the seasons. As such, in almost all cultures, agriculture and astronomy became profoundly intertwined. As the seasons cycled through birth, fecundity, decay, and then death in a way that mirrored all life, the cyclical patterns of the heavens, some of which we have already discussed, became a way to understand the ever-changing but always renewing and returning reality each family, clan, and tribe found itself in. In order to make sense of the forces of nature around them, the uneven regularity of the seasonal changes to climate and the unwavering precision of the heavens, peoples developed supernatural explanations to explain the world around them and told stories to remember the powerful rhythms that brought life to and sustained their cultures. Likely arising from shamanism and animalism, these religions soon took on cosmic meanings through inclusion of not just the natural world directly present, but in including associations with the heavens. One of the earliest cultures we have a rich record of this occurring in is that of Egypt. With artifacts and fundamental writing dating back to the Old Kingdom in roughly 3300 BCE, we can clearly see not only the specialization of roles within the society, but also the creation of profound stories designed to not only explain the cycles of heaven and earth, but also the deeper mysteries of life and death and the action of providence in the lives of the people from day to day and year to year. In this episode, we'll look at the interwoven strands of Egyptian astronomy, agriculture, and religion as a way to gain a deeper understanding of how and why this knowledge was acquired and enshrined in the culture's stories, rituals, buildings, and aspirations. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 2.1, Supplemental. Ancient Egyptian Astronomy. To begin this episode, there are a few things I should make clear at the outset before we jump into some of the things that we know. First, lest I be accused of some Western cultural bias, let me explain that this is the first of several supplemental episodes of this sort I plan to intersperse over the next couple of months that will discuss the astronomy of various ancient cultures worldwide. My plan is to examine the ancient astronomical traditions of the Chinese, the native North Americans, the Celtic peoples, the Central and South American empires, and the tribes of Central Africa, before moving on to Babylonian and Greek astronomy. 
If you feel like I may be missing an important or particularly interesting group of culture, drop me a note at the podcast website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com, or on our Facebook page, and I'll be more than happy to look into it and see if it's great for inclusion. Second, while I am using a number of sources here, I want to specifically mention an excellent book by E.C. Krupp titled Echoes of the Ancient Skies, Astronomy of Lost Civilizations, published by Dover Books. Krupp is a distinguished researcher associated with the Griffiths Observatory in a field usually known as archaeoastronomy, and his book is really a fine source of information. His organization of the material is by topic rather than culture, i.e. funerary practices, telling time by month and year, rituals and rites, temple construction and architecture, etc. And it's an approach that highlights the strong similarities between the different cultures and societies and their connection to the night sky. For those interested in exploring this field of scientific research, this really is a great resource, and it's a good place to start before wading into deeper waters. This leads to the third point I'd like to explore. It can be particularly startling to see some of the strong resemblances between cultures when examining their various cultural products, i.e. religions, customs, architecture, artifacts, etc. Many cultures share similar practices and narratives when it comes to their astronomical ideas. For example, on different sides of the Atlantic, one can find nearly identical iconography and stone carvings between the Egyptians and the Incas and Mayans. Throughout the last few centuries, there have been many explanations developed to explain these similarities, ranging from the scientific hypotheses found in the fields of archaeology and anthropology, to ones based on outdated racial arguments, to the absolutely ludicrous, not to specifically mention any absurd television programming found on the dubiously named History Channel. To focus on the former of these, the most common explanations are usually either that there was some form of cultural sharing that took place or that human beings saw in their world the same things and responded in similar fashions. So let's take a moment to examine each of these. The cultural sharing idea is that two cultures that possess similar astronomical traditions do so because they have exchanged or inherited information from one another. One fairly well-established instance of this is the practice of marking solar events such as winter and summer solstices found in native peoples in the southwest parts of the United States. It is fairly clear that the native Navajo and Hopi tribes inherited some of the practices of the earlier Anasazi peoples. Additionally, there is strong evidence of cultural sharing between the tribes in what is now Southern California and those peoples from Arizona and New Mexico. In the case of the cross-Atlantic similarities I mentioned a bit ago, the claim is often made that travel between the New and Old World began much, much earlier than is originally supposed. The use of pyramids by both the Egyptians and many native peoples in the New Worlds, most notably in Central and South America, is seen as an argument that the idea originated in one place and then spread to another with the usual order stated being from the much older Egyptian examples to the newer Incan, Mayan, and Cahoka peoples. This case is made stronger when one examines the carvings within the pyramids, wherein one sees similar images portrayed, such as figures with missing lower legs that have bones protruding. As archaeologists and anthropologists continue to uncover evidence and artifacts, it is certainly clear that contact between the two continents across the Atlantic did likely occur much earlier than the 1492 date so long touted in children's history books. The question, however, is whether Mediterranean voyagers from Egypt's Old Kingdom, say, would have ventured through the Straits of Gibraltar and then braved the long Atlantic journey, either around a periphery less likely ice-bound than today, or across the vast expanse of open water separating North Africa from South and Central America. In support of this idea, it seems fairly clear that at least on the Pacific side of the New World, migration patterns and climatological variations would have meant significant and prolonged contact between the peoples on either side of the Pacific, something we'll return to in a later episode. Additionally, we know that Pacific Islanders were often able to make startlingly long journeys across open waters in surprisingly small craft using astronomical navigation skills that were well honed. 
Now, as interesting and compelling as these arguments are for some, they remain, at least at this point, accepted only by a small minority of the scientific research community. The claim here is a pretty extraordinary one, and thus it requires fairly extraordinary evidence to support it. For most, the present evidence is either lacking or better explained in some other way, and so the scientific consensus is gathered around a different paradigm, to use Thomas Kuhn's terminology. Nevertheless, it should be noted that this position has not been shown to be impossible, and thus it remains, at least for a few, a viable alternative to the more commonly accepted explanation. This explanation is that human beings are human beings, and that they share a number of common experiences, which lead to a series of common responses. An example of this would have to do with the invention of pyramid-like structures in many cultures across the globe. If one assumes that when people begin to settle down, they don't want the remains of those who have died just lying around to attract predators and spread disease, there are two basic responses to deal with the corpses. One is to burn them, and the other is to cover them up. The first is probably the most effective solution in places where there's a lot of burnable material not being used for other things, and thus is found in cultures of Northern Europe, for example, and often it is done in association with astronomically significant sacred sites. However, if that's not the case, burial is probably the next best solution. In this case, a shallow grave covered with hard-to-move stones would have provided an excellent solution. However, as is often the case in tribal structures, there are those who are more revered because of their perceived virtues or character. During their lives, for example, they might have showed exceptional bravery, wisdom, loyalty, and so on. For those individuals, it would have been natural to want to construct a larger pile of stones to mark the final resting place. As these grew larger, the tendency of the human mind to seek order and regularity would have structured the mounds of stone more regularly and ornamentally. As tribes settled down and grew into civilizations, these would have become larger until those who ruled began to explicitly look to construct them ever larger and more elaborately for a variety of reasons. These would then have taken on additional purposes and symbolism in a culture as it connected the cyclic nature of life with the ever-repeating cycles of the night sky. Therefore, the ubiquity of pyramids, according to this explanation, is due to the natural human tendencies in dealing with a common problem in similar environments. In similar ways, as each culture dealt with the issues of developing a reliable agricultural calendar using the same night sky, they might invoke similar images and iconography while trying to make sense of their experience. The seasonal cycles of death, rebirth, growth, and then decay would have been experienced by most and thus would have been important motifs to include in spiritual or religious ceremonies tied to the regularity of heavenly cycles. In the case of the moon, for example, with its monthly waxing and waning phases, many cultures would have associated it with the various seasonal cycles of death and resurrection. This pattern would then be repeated as those cultures came to understand the motions of the sun and the solar year. That having been said, it is also likely that similar cultural and language groups would have shared similar assumptions. Nearly every people found in the Indo-European and Semitic language groups are found to have employed polytheism as a prominent religious or supernatural framework of explanation, while Asiatic groups practice shamanism or ancestor worship. As the historian of science Owen Gingrich has pointed out, it's really surprising how many cultures across the Northern Hemisphere see a bear in the groups of stars known today as the Big Dipper. His suggestion is that this is due to the fact that Ice Age peoples were doing astronomy and assigning names to obvious groups of stars prior to splitting into different cultures and civilizations. In another example of this, it's clear that the later Babylonians inherited much from the earlier Sumerians, just as Romans took much from the Greek, Egyptian, and even Phoenician cultures they interacted with. The takeaway from this last piece is that in cultures and civilizations where some type of or level of contact was likely, both mechanisms, cultural sharing, and this common response would, could well have been in play in developing their rituals. Fourth, as we move into our discussion of Egyptian practice, we should make a note about cultural preference and assumption. In Western civilization, 
I think it's safe to say that for much of our history, we have been more comfortable with allegory than loose metaphor, a trend that has been strengthened with the advent of scientific methods of inquiry with their emphasis on classification and reduction. According to some historians and anthropologists, this preference is one of the defining characteristics that is often called Western or classical culture. For those of us raised in and educated in this tradition, we want our stories to be clear and our identifications of personages and symbols to be unambiguous and constant. However, as we discuss ancient Egyptian astronomy and religion, we will often find that that's not the case. As is often the case in much Near Eastern religious material that dates before the classical synthesis of a linear view of time and a somewhat naturalistic explanation of the physical world, identification is a lot more flexible. For example, when we talk of the moon in Egyptian religion, we'll find that there are several figures associated with it. There is Khonshu, from among the first of the gods, and then Toth. Among men who ascend to the heavens, there is both Osiris and his son Horus, who are associated with it as well. In figures and writings found in Egyptian temples and pyramids, it can be difficult and confusing to keep track of just which figure is intended in a specific case. In a relief carving, is the person associated with the moon Osiris, Toph, or Horus? Or, as is sometimes the case, is there more than one figure in the relief associated with a specific celestial item? To put it another way, how do we in the West, who are most comfortable with a one personage equals one object assignment way of constructing narrative, to deal with this? Perhaps the best way to understand all of this is to recognize that the moon fulfills several roles in Egyptian religion. It is a celestial thing, and that object is often associated with Khonshu. It is a way of measuring time and holding within it the knowledge and wisdom of when things happen in the natural world. And so that aspect is encompassed within Toth, the Egyptian god of wisdom, knowledge, and healing. As the moon goes through cycles of death and rebirth, mirroring the natural world and the hope of human experience, it becomes symbolically associated with Osiris in the great passion narrative of the Egyptians. Finally, in the life of Horus, who is said to see, it becomes one of his eyes, as it was thought that light both emanated from and entered into the eye, at least during some of that time. Thus, the moon is not a single thing in Egyptian religion, but a thing that has many aspects, each with an affiliation to a supernatural being. Hopefully this approach, not only with the moon, but also with other things such as the sun and various stars or regions of the sky, will help you to keep straight all of the different associations. Finally, and finally, two more very quick things. For the Egyptians, there is no difference between religion and astronomy in a sense. Religion was vital to understanding how two things worked. First, it was fundamental to agriculture as it was thought that supernatural beings were responsible for the growth of all that sustained humanity. And second, it explained how to navigate the transition from this physical realm to a different supernatural and immortal realm. The Egyptians understood astronomy as the unchanging guide to understanding and enabling both of those ends. As we will see over and over, for the Egyptians, doing astronomy was to practice religion. Be careful, however, not to confuse this with the incorrect idea that the Egyptians worshipped the sky or that they worshipped astronomy as a practice. It was instead a tool that helped them to understand and interact with their deities that were represented in the heavens. Also, as a part of this episode, I don't plan to go into any of the political or historical aspects of the civilization beyond what is directly necessary to understand the astronomy. For those seeking more historical information in a podcast form, I would recommend Rob Monaco's Podcast History of Our World, Dominic Perry's Egyptian History Podcast, and Eric Wells' Eric's Guide to Ancient Egypt Podcast. So, with all of that out of the way, and there was a lot of that to get out of the way, let's move on to talking about astronomy in ancient Egypt. So, 
So let's start with a very brief introduction to Egyptian religion. Again, I want to emphasize that this is a very, very brief description of those things that have relevance to our discussion here. Those seeking a more in-depth investigation of the various narratives of the gods and supernatural heroes of the Valley of the Nile should consult the sources I've mentioned previously. In Egyptian religion, the fundamental idea was the presence of Ma'at, which is representative of the order of the world. Ma'at is brought by the sun god Ra, and is often symbolized through the distribution of the gift of the sun's rays. This is in contrast with the primordial chaos encompassed in the god Nun. The earth, initially portrayed as flat and then later as an upwardly curving bowl, is represented by the god Geb, over which arches the sky in the form of the goddess Nut. It should be noted that this represents an inversion of the usual Mother Earth, Father Sky motif found in many early religious systems. This is likely due to the association of the earth and sky with human fertility, with the life-giving seed of rain falling upon the earth, and from that, life growing. Egypt, however, receives very little rain, and so it will be the Nile that will come to take on the male fertility role in the mythologies. Ra, Geb, Nut, and Toth, and other deities are said to have emerged from Atum, who held within himself all of the elements of the world and who emerged out of Nun as the first expression of Ma'at. Ra is said to travel across the body of Nut until he enters the realm of Duat by being swallowed by her mouth for the night to emerge the next morning from her loins. The next major story cycle is that of Osiris. As mentioned in the intro to the previous podcast on moon motions, Osiris is the prototypical pharaoh who is responsible for establishing Ma'at, or order, in Egypt through putting into practice the will of Ra, Toth, and the other gods. He is killed and usurped by his brother Set, who represents chaos, and it is only through the efforts of his consort Isis that his body is recovered, and an heir, Horus, is produced through the intervention of Toth on Isis's behalf. Set finds the body of Osiris and cuts it into 14 pieces, scattering them across the land, and once again, Isis must find them to reassemble her dead husband. She finds all of the pieces with the exception of his sexual member, which is lost to the Nile, thus imbuing the river with the fertility to replenish and restore Egypt's agricultural lands each year. After a time, Horus will contest with Set for the throne, and after a series of battles, wounds, and indignities, will emerge the victor. The cost for this, however, will be the loss of an eye, or in some version of the stories, both eyes. This lost or wounded eye is restored by Toth at the end of the conflict, and the triumph of Horus over Set represents a restoration of order over chaos, represented by the violence and treachery of Set's time of rule. Only then is Horus able to perform the proper funerary rites for his father Osiris. Osiris, as a result, is taken into the heavens, where he becomes something of a ruler, guardian, and shepherd for those who must undertake the journey through Duat to re-emerge on the other side of the sky. He is the weigher of souls and the judge of all men as well. In this way, Osiris comes to represent resurrection and regeneration. Upon her death, Isis rejoins him as his queen. In time, when Horus dies, he becomes a deity of the sky, with his good eye representing the sun, and the once wounded and dimmer eye representing the moon. In their relationship with each other in this way, Osiris will become a king of the dead, while Horus will take up a spiritual role as king of the living. Set will be placed in the heavens among the undying circumpolar stars, usually associated with the stars of the Big Dipper though the Egyptians saw that particular grouping as the hindquarters of a great bull or ox. So let's turn now to connecting the religious beliefs and practices to the astronomical side by first considering the very early practice of astronomy. 
Our earliest evidence of the practice of astronomy in the region of the Nile is an 8,500-year-old piece of bone from the Nile's headwaters near Lake Edward in a place called Inshango. This bone is marked with 168 scratches made in groups corresponding to lunar phase cycles by different tools. It seems clear, at least by this point, that the peoples of the Upper Nile region are tracking, counting, and recording the phases of the moon as a timekeeping measure. Jumping forward, we have found stone circles dating from the 5th millennium BCE to the region called Nopta Playa, in the region later known as Kush at the Upper Nile. While piecing together the purposes of each of the stones is difficult and a number of uncertainties remain, it is thought that the earliest of these circles were used to site alignments for the moon's rising and setting, with later circles being used to establish a solar calendar and, very importantly, to mark the rising of Sirius. At this point, it's really useful for us to define an astronomical term, heliacal rising. This is defined as the date of the earliest rising of an astronomical object ahead of the sun that can actually be observed. As we will discuss in the next episode, the sun travels through the sky west to east against the background stars. Now, of course, while the sun is above the horizon, one can't actually see the stars. So, the rising and setting of stars on about 35 degrees of either side of the sun can't actually be seen. What this means is that for about 70 days, a particular star will not be able to be viewed at any time during the night as its light will be obscured by the sun as it's up. Even for the first hour after sunset in the evening, if the star is to the west, or the last hour of night before sunrise, if the star is to the east. So, as the sun moves through the sky, different stars will be in view, and at different times of the year, certain stars will, be go, will go from not being able to be seen to just being able to be seen rising in the east just before the light of the sun washes them out. Each day after this, the star will then rise four minutes earlier and will be visible longer before the sun rises. The period when the star is just visible for a short time before the sky gets too light for it to be seen is known as its heliacal rising. For the Egyptians, the key star to observe the heliacal rising for was Sopdet, what we call Cirrus. The reason for this is twofold. First, the heliacal rising of Cirrus corresponded to the summer solstice, marking the longest day of the year in the northern hemisphere. More importantly, however, it also signaled the coming yearly flood of the Nile. As Lower Egypt receives very little rain, being able to predict the timing of this event would have been extremely important. One final note on this topic. As mentioned previously, the number of days that a star would be too close to the sun in the sky to be visible at night was 70 days. In Egyptian religious symbolism, this was the time that the star either passed from the realm of this world or merged with the light of Ra, depending on the time period we're talking about. Thus, this became the prescribed time of purification in the process of mummification for those wealthy enough to afford such a thing. By the time we encounter the Egyptian record keeping in the 3rd millennium BCE, it is clear that a 365 day solar calendar has been developed in addition to an older lunar calendar, most likely based on observations made from these original stone circles we were just talking about. This calendar was organized into 12 30 day months, each of those months being divided into the three 10 day periods. The entire calendar was divided into three four month seasons. The additional five days were added to the end of the year, suggesting that they were appended onto an original 360-day year that had been developed from the earlier 354-day lunar calendar still being used for religious purposes. As mentioned in an earlier podcast, each month began on the day of the last visible waning crescent moon and was named for the principal religious feast that took place during that month similar to the Islamic naming of the month of Ramadan after that most important of religious observances in the ecclesial life of that faith. Each day of the month was named for a feast or priestly activity taken from the narratives that formed the engine of Egyptian religious life. 
The difference between a lunar name based naming system for days likely held over from the early 354 day religious calendar and the 365 day civil calendar was a source of great difficulty in attempting to understand dating in Egyptian documents. A more pressing problem, however, one faced by all lunar solar calendars, is that of trying to mix the 354 day length of the 12 complete phase turning cycle of the moon with the 365 day cycle of the sun's motion. And it's how to deal with that 11 day difference between the two. If this is not dealt with, the important date of the summer solstice will move through the religious calendar, which is a disaster for the Nile oriented civilization that lent spiritual meaning to the yearly floods. The solution to this was one used by many cultures that use mixed calendar systems, the periodic addition of a 13th leap month to the calendar. This is a place where the heliacal rising of Sirius becomes very important. This rising was supposed to take place in the last month of the year, called Wep Rinpet. However, due to the 11 days of slippage, as it were, if Sirius first rose in the pre-dawn twilight on the first day of this month one year, it would rise on the 12th day the next, and on the 23rd day the year after that. The year following, if the progression was allowed to continue, the rising of Sirius would take place in the first month of the new year, called Teki. To prevent this, if Sirius rose in the last decade of Wep Rinpet, a leap month called Toth for the symbolic reason that Toth was the god who properly measured out both the heavens and the earth, was added to the year to reset the cycle. This leap month would be added on average every third year, or seven times every 19 years to be more exact. It is clear from ivory tablets, dating from the first dynasty of the Old Kingdom, that this system was already in place by the time of the upper and lower kingdoms being unified by 3100 BCE. This calendar, with a few modest modifications, would remain in place until Egypt was conquered by Alexander the Great and then ruled by the family of his general, Ptolemy. In fact, it would be the calendar that would be adopted by the Roman Republic after it moved away from a purely lunar calendar and would be used until the Julian reforms first attempted by Julius Caesar and then fully and correctly implemented by his successor, Augustus. subject deals with one of the most fascinating objects of Egyptian architecture and astronomy, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Built in the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom, dating to around 2600 BCE, it is a wonder of construction and measurement created to see that the pharaoh of the time, thought to be Khufu, would take his appropriate place in the night sky among the deities. One of the seven ancient wonders of the world, it is the only one still standing, and it gives gives rise to the Arab proverb, man fears time, but time fears the pyramids. It was constructed out of approximately 2.5 million blocks of stone, weighing between 1.5 and, and 15 tons. The volume of the structure would hold St. Peter's Cathedral, St. Paul's and Westminster Abbey, and the Duomos of Milan and Florence combined. The base covers more than 13 acres of land, and when it was originally built, it rose to a height of over 480 feet. Originally, it was sheathed in a layer of brilliant white limestone and capped with a gold-covered capstone 31 feet tall. And yet, as impressive as these numbers are, they only serve to magnify the architectural accomplishment of aligning the structure. The base is aligned almost perfectly along north-south-east-west lines with the worst error being only about five minutes of arc off the perfect and the intersections of the corners of the base being almost perfect right angles. The greatest difference in the length of the sides is about eight inches out of 750 feet. Additionally, 
as the sides of the pyramid rise from the Giza Plateau, they don't twist on their 51 degrees rise to the peak. When their lengths are expressed in the known unit length of the time, known as the royal cubit, the ratio of the perimeter of the period, 1,760 royal cubits, to its height, 280, is within 0.05% of 2 times pi. While there is a good deal of scholarly debate as to whether this was intentional, the conclusion that must be reached from these statistics as a whole is that the builders of the fourth dynasty were in possession of exceptionally accurate methods of design, measurement, and construction, and thus that it's unlikely that any of the elements of the pyramid's construction are merely coincidence. For our discussion here, the most notable element has to do with what's known as the Chamber of the King. The chamber would have been accessed through a descending passage from the entrance that then intersected with an ascending passage. While the descending passage continues down to a set of unfinished chambers, the ascending passage continues upwards until it encounters an intersection. At this intersection, one can walk down a level passage to the Queen's Chamber or continue upward along what is known as the Grand Gallery. This larger pathway is 153 feet long, 7 feet wide, and has an arched ceiling of about 28 feet high. While fairly steeply inclined, one can still walk it to the King's Chamber. The King's Chamber itself, aligned with north-south and east-west, with lengths of about 17 and 34 feet respectively, has a height of about 19 feet and two shafts three feet from the floor in the north and south walls respectively. The chamber is lined with Aswan granite mined 500 miles to the north, kind of giving a sense of how important it was. The shafts, each measuring about nine inches on a side, angle upward through the pyramid stone after a short horizontal portion to reach the outside of the pyramid. While originally thought to be ventilation shafts, in 1964, Egyptologist Eugene Badawi and astronomer Virginia Trimble were able to ascertain the true purpose of the structures. As we will discuss more fully in a later episode of the podcast, the Earth undergoes a motion known as precession, where its rotation axis wobbles slowly over a period of about 23,000 years. The upshot of this precession is that the North Pole of the globe changes the direction it points over time. Right now, the North Pole points at Polaris, but when the Great Pyramid was built, it would have been pointed at a star we now call Thuban. The northern shaft, inclined at an angle of 31 degrees, points in such a way that it exits the northern wall of the pyramid, pointing at where Thuban would have been at the time. While one cannot sight down the shaft due to that initial horizontal section I mentioned, it is clear that the shaft was to conduct the Pharaoh's spirit to the realm of the immortal gods or imperishable stars, as represented by the unsetting circumpolar region that rotated around the unchanging Thuban. The southern shaft was constructed with an angle of 44.5 degrees, allowing it to align with the middle star of the belt of Orion, or Osiris, as the Egyptians knew the constellation. Osiris, of course, was the deity who, among other things, was responsible for overseeing the resurrection of souls and fertility bestowed by the Nile upon Egypt. In this way, then, the Great Pyramid served as something of a transformational device that served to transport the soul of the Great Pharaoh from the earthly realm to the plane or realm of immortality through the intervention of Osiris. In the Queen's Chamber below the Kings, there are also two shafts that are also astronomically aligned. The northern shaft points into the constellation known as the Hippo, also symbolizing immortality, while the southern shaft would have aligned with the path of Cirrus, through the sky, symbolizing an association with Isis, the consort of Osiris. The way we know of these earliest associations in these pyramids with the Osiris narrative is through something known as the pyramid texts. While the Great Pyramid itself has very little writing, later Old Kingdom pyramids have a great deal of writing in the tomb chambers of the pharaohs that explicitly link the structures to the story and work of Osiris in guiding the now immortal ruler's passage through none into the realm of the imperishable stars. An example of this can be found in the tomb of Teddy I. Oh ho! Oh ho! Rise up, O Teddy! Take your head! 
Collect your bones. Gather your limbs. Shake the earth from your flesh. Take your bread that rots not, your beer that sours not. Stand at the gates that bar the common people. The gatekeeper comes out to you. He grasps your hand, takes you into heaven to your father Geb. He rejoices at your coming, gives you his hands, kisses you, caresses you, sets you before the spirits, the imperishable stars. The hidden ones worship you. The great ones surround you. The watchers wait upon you. Barley is threshed for you. Emir is reaped for you. Your monthly feasts are made with it. Your half-month feasts are made with it. As order done for you by Geb, your father, rise up, O Teddy. You shall not die. While these pyramid texts would only be found in the tombs of the pharaohs during the dynasties of the Old Kingdom, they would spread to other high-ranking officials of the rich by the period of the Middle Kingdom. The most notable part of these writings is known as the Book of Nut, or the Fundamentals of the Course of the Stars. These writings mix religious materials with astronomical observation as a way to explain the supernatural processes that govern the world through heavenly signs and symbols. From these would be developed two additional tools to guide the dead at the beginning of their journey into the afterlife. The first of these are known as the coffin texts and basically consist of incantations for the transitions and transformations to come. The other are known as the decans tables or diagonal star charts. These tables recorded the rising and setting times of about 30 important stars or groupings of stars for each month of the calendar. While it is almost certain that these were copies made from documents in the possessions of priests or court astronomers of the Middle Kingdom, they would never have been used by a living person. Instead, they were meant as maps of a sort to guide the soul to its proper place at the side of Osiris for the next part of the journey to immortality. By the time of the New Kingdom, the time of pyramid building had mostly passed. By this point, Temple construction was predominant, and it was clear that these would have been carefully planned in accordance with appropriate astronomical care. When the pharaohs of this time would begin the construction of a temple, they would perform a ceremony known as stretching the cord that invoked the assistance of a goddess, Sishat. Sishat was associated with the technologies of writing, record-keeping, and temple construction, in accordance with her will, the pharaoh would mark out the boundaries of a temple's foundation along with the required astronomical orientation. She was represented in carvings as wearing a leopard skin, symbolic of both the night and, through the animal skin's dramatic spots, a star-filled visage. A replica of such a cloak, made of linen with a wooden leopard's head and silver claws, was found among the treasures in the tomb of Tutankhamun. In Dendera, inscribed in the walls of the Temple of Hanthor, is found the following regarding the Pharaoh's part in the ritual. He stretches the rope in joy, with his glance towards the Ack of the Bull's thigh constellation. He establishes the temple in the mistress of Dendera, as took place there before. The reliefs at the temple also record the Pharaoh himself as he describes what he is doing. Looking to the sky at the course of the rising stars, recognizing the ack of the bull's thigh constellation, I establish the corners of the temple of Her Majesty. At the temple of Horus and Edru, from about the same time, there is a similar inscription. I have grasped the stake along with the handle of the mallet. I take the measuring cord in the country of Sashat, I consider the progressive movement of the stars. My eye is fixed upon the bull's thigh constellation. I count off time, scrutinize the clock, and establish the corners of thy temple. As can be seen from these references, the work of the pharaoh was clear, establishing the orientation of the temple by a set of stars. But which ones? If we take the bull's thigh as a marker, this would indicate an association interestingly, with the Big Dipper, and, accordingly, was set. What isn't well understood is what is meant by the Ack. 
Perhaps this is a specific star. Say the bend in the handle of the dipper, what we now call mines are. Another likely possibility is that it, the term refers to a specific orientation of the dipper on a given day of the calendar. Astronomer Norman Lockyer was the first to attempt to determine the alignment of perhaps the best known of the New Kingdom temples, the Great Temple of Amon-Ra at Karnak. Lockyer, who was also known as the discoverer of helium in the spectrum of the sun, thought that the temple was oriented so that the light of the setting sun on the longest day of the year, the summer solstice, would penetrate down the long rows of columns to the innermost chamber of the great edifice. Gerald Hawkins, however, was able to show that a low range of hills would have blocked the light of the sun just at sunset, and that the whole orientation of Lockyer would have worked had it not been for the hills. However, because of those hills, there must have been another alignment enshrined in its architecture. In time, he was able to show that a room, a small two-room chapel in a portion of the temple specifically dedicated to festivals held in honor of the god, would allow a priest standing to the left of the altar to sight the rising of the sun exactly on the day of the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. It was likely this observance that would have been ritualistically made each year during a celebration of the return of the sun, held in recognition that the days would no longer grow shorter, but would again increase in length, thus signaling victory over death and darkness. Hawkins has since shown that other New Kingdom temples are also so aligned, with the temple at Abu Simbel also possessing a simple chapel and altar. Other temples, such as the temple of Halthor at Dendera, were situated so as to observe the monumentally important rising of Cirrus. By the time of the New Kingdom, Halthor, an ancient mother goddess in the Egyptian pantheon, had risen to become associated with Isis as a mother of a new year, indicated by the rising of Cirrus and Nut, out of whom's womb the new sun was soon to rise. <laughs> with the Pharaoh and his symbolic association with the heavens that we will conclude our discussion of ancient Egyptian astronomy. As mentioned earlier in the episode, the central figure of Egyptian religion was Ra, who is represented as the sun in its aspect of the gift of life-giving and order bestowing Ma'at through the sun's rays. From Ra, this giving of Ma'at was first granted to Osiris who brought order to Egypt and then to Horus whose eye would come to symbolize the sun. This association was passed down through each successive pharaoh upon the establishment of the first dynasty. To quote E.C. Krupp, In Egypt, an intricate network of language and ceremony reinforced a resonance between the sun and the pharaoh. The name of the sun was incorporated often in the cartouche of the king. The king wore the uraeus, the divine solar cobra, on his crown. The king's public appearance on the throne was equated with the sun's arrival on the horizon. Both concepts shared the same verb, a hieroglyph of the sun emerging from the primordial mound of creation. Enemies of the king were supposed to suffer the same defeat as a pep, the serpentine nemesis that faced Ra in the last hour of his journey through the night. A festival of royal rejuvenation, the said, when held, was scheduled on the, for the first day of the first month of the first season. Timed then at the new year, the said invoked the notions of recreation and reestablishment of the world order. Just as the sun was renewed, the pharaoh was re-energized, and so too was the land. Like the sun, the pharaoh was divine. He was the son of the sun." Unquote. In death, the pharaoh was conducted to the heavens through a ritual designed to reenact and engage the prominent symbols of the Osiris story. One of the rites performed was known as the opening of the mouth. 
and it was intended to restore the Pharaoh's ka. In this act, the priest touched the eyes and lips of the dead Pharaoh with an instrument in the shape of a thigh bone that was given the same name as the Egyptian word for the Big Dipper, Mesketu. This action was intended to restore the Pharaoh's personality to the body and reanimate the senses in preparation for the journey to the afterlife. This instrument was also meant to represent Set, who is now moored to the celestial pole by the victory of Horus over the chaos he represented. The celebrant of the rite, known as the Sem priest and dressed in leopard skin, now took the place of Horus. Usually the successor to the dead Pharaoh, the Sem priest spiritually revised his deceased predecessor, just as Horus had done his father, thus reenacting the narrative of defeating Set and overseeing the ascension of the son of Ra. Through the taking of the symbols of Set and using them in the service of resurrection, order triumphs over chaos and the temporal becomes eternal. This brings us to the end of our discussion of ancient Egyptian astronomy and the nearly 3,000 year unbroken lineage of a religion writ large on the canvas of the sky. While the pharaohs would eventually fall to the armies of Alexander, the culture's influence would still be found in the temples built during the Ptolemaic pyramid. By that time, however, the practice of astronomy had begun to move out of the realm of the supernatural and towards an explanation of the real structure of the cosmos. Before we get there though, we have more to learn about the motions of the objects in the heavens. In the next episode, we'll look at the movement of that most powerful of celestial objects, the sun, and see how it varies with the seasons. Between now and then, be sure to check out the Blue Dot Sessions whose music has accompanied this episode. Also, if you're enjoying the content, we'd love to hear about it. Leave us a positive review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get the content. Until next time, full sails on your journey.